Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you as we just uh, trust you today. Lord, I thank you that the word that you've given me, that God, that as I just get out of the way, that I let your Holy Spirit just come forth, that I know that it's going to transform us. God, it's going to convict us. God, it's going to lead us to you. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. 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 Well, this message that I've, I've got prepared for us today is one that's probably been sitting in my heart for several months. Several months, I, I read this passage of Scripture that we're going to pull some points out of later, and I just felt God's been stirring me for months about just me personally. And uh, obviously, there's been a few changes in some of the roles that I've had here at church, and it's just been amazing what God's been doing just in church and in our family and obviously the church is abroad. But, but this scripture, it just challenged me so much because we can often find ourselves so distracted from God, so easily distracted from God. And so today we're going to explore that. And I'm going to start with Romans 3, 23 to 24 in the message. And it says this, But in our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets witnessed to all, those, to all those years has happened. The God setting things right that we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. For there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we have compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both us and them, and prove that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us. God did it for us. He did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, He put us in right standing with Himself. A pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where He always wanted us to be. He did this by means of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I've got a bit of a reputation in my household of misplacing things. Like when I'm literally about to leave the house, I start frantically getting or looking around for my keys, my phone, my glasses, and I'm running around trying to get really up, only to find my glasses are on my head, my pockets, my, my phone's in my pocket, and my keys are in my jacket. Is anyone else with me right now? Do you have a habit of misplacing things only to find that you had it the whole time? See, what I love about this scripture is that it's, it's declaring and it's saying that we couldn't do it on our own. We couldn't work it out on our own. We could never measure up to what God has for us. But because of Jesus, God sent His Son that He paid a price so that we now don't have to do anything for it but to say, yes, I'm here. That you've already got it. It's such a crazy thought to think that we don't have to do anything more to receive the, the favour and the glory and the wonderful gift from heaven but to simply say, yes, and thank you. But so often we get distracted. So often we forget that we are already highly blessed and highly favoured in Jesus. We forget that we've already got it in Him. I love that we're so glad that we have a God that had a better plan, one where He desires us to grow, increase in favour, not remain stationary, but increase in His grace and mercy. Though we fail, God doesn't abandon us, but He sent His Son, Jesus, who became flesh to set things right. And this is the title of my message. Because of Jesus, are you ready? We already have it. We already have it. Because of Jesus, we already have it. I love that. Just let that sit in just for a moment. Think about it. We already have it. We're already blessed. We're already highly favoured in Jesus' name. But this is what happens. We lose focus. We lose our true north. And we find ourselves focusing on things that we shouldn't really be focused on. And rather than sitting in the favour of God, we go chasing for it. Or we go hunting for it. Or we think it's over here and over there. But no, God said, no, he set things right. He, he's already done it. And we're already blessed. We're going to explore a, a scripture 
in John 21, a story where we're, it's a familiar story and we've heard it before, but it's at the end. It's the beginning of the disciples going out in all the world, making disciples. They're about, they've been set on task, they've been given their purpose, they've been given their instructions to do, but they've found themselves distracted and nowhere near where God called them to be. It's in John 21, and I'm going to read it to you, and then we'll, uh, we'll unpack some practical ways of how we can actually maintain the, the favor of God in our lives, that we can keep focused on what God's already given us. In John 21, in uh, the NIV, it says this, Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side. Say right side. Right side. Come on, we can say it together. There's only, come on. After three. One, two, three. Right. There we go. We got it. Of the boat. And you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. They were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals, a burning of coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed abroad. And dragged the net ashore. It was full, large, it was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many that so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who you are who who are you? They knew it. They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and some of the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to disciples after he was raised from the dead. What an incredible story. If you remember at the very beginning of the Gospels, we read about the beginning of Luke where Jesus found the disciples, appointed the disciples and asked him to follow him. Again, he was in the same situation. It was the same story. He was reminding the disciples who he was, what they have in him and that they had a task. You know, I mean, this wasn't a, a, you didn't know, and now you know. No, it, they already knew, but they found themselves distracted. And so we're going to look at, in this passage, we're going to pull out a few points. We're going to look at three ways that we control our focus so that we can receive God's favor into our lives. And the first point is this. If we're going to receive or stay focused on what God has for us in his favor, right thinking receives God's favor. In other words, focus what you think. It says here in John 21, 3, that Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Well, we'll come too. And they all said, and they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. All night. These guys knew how to fish. They were fishermen. What's funny is that in the water, the fish were always there. Nothing had actually changed. That these guys who had been given Matthew 28 to go out into all the world, make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These disciples that were called to change the world, where were they? Fishing. They were far from what God had actually called them to do. I think about it this way. I think what God thinks and what we think is often very similar to how mums and dads think when we're packing for the holidays. You know, you look at a mum 
And when they're packing for the holidays, they're thinking about swimmers and sunscreen. They're thinking about we've got to bring a first aid kit and we've got to bring enough clothes to last the five days that we're about to do that. We've got to bring snacks to the car so the kids don't get distracted. We've got to make sure the iPad's charged so that the kids don't get noisy and they don't start yelling at us because the movie's not working anymore. And they bring a fire extinguisher because Israel is trying to eat his sisters. And then, you know, and there's all these things. And then the dad, this is, the dad just goes, all right, I got my thongs, I got my shorts, I got my sunscreen. Okay, cool. Can, seriously, why are you taking so long? These disciples, they'd seen the dead come to life. They'd seen blind men see. What went wrong? They'd lost their focus. They started thinking about things that God never thought asked them to think about. They started making considerations about what God called them to do, but instead they went fishing. And I think we do the same thing, that we often, when God calls into something or we, we have a a, a biblical discipline that God's asking us to step into, we start making all these considerations. You know, I think about the tithe. God's called us to tithe. It's very, very simple. But often we find ourselves distracted and making considerations about it that we shouldn't be thinking about. That when we're about to tithe, okay, well, I know I've got to tithe, but I know that bill's about to come in. I know I've got to tithe, but I know I've got to pay the school fees. I know, the, I know I've got to tithe, but... Man, if I don't pay my phone bill, then I'm not going to be able to get on social media anymore and I'm not going to be able to get on Instagram and I'm not going to be able to show everybody how good my life is right now. We start making all these considerations when it comes to attending church. God called, called the, the saints to gather. He made a very simple why so that we can encourage each other. We can't neglect that fact. But then we start making all these considerations. We start thinking about things like the weather and we start thinking about you know, whether the kids are being good or if they're being fed or if we're going to make it or I've got chores, I've got the lawn to do today. We're making considerations and thinking about things that God never asked us to think about. But this is what I know. That when we, when we begin to focus our mind on heaven above, we're positioning our lives for the favour of God. You know, I mean, we just had 21 days of prayer and fasting. That was an, like, I love that. And with the sole goal of drawing closer to Him. And I know that right through our church, we've had so many amazing breakthroughs. We sent an email out last week where we've basically invited um, the church to let us know what you were believing for and, and share a testimony of what, um, what might have come through that time. And already we've had these these emails coming, coming through of what God's been doing and it's been great standing with people. You know, me being a very simple person, I know that during that 21 days of fasting, fasting food, you've got to remember I'm Greek, fasting food is a hard thing. I do everything around food. And this particular day, I was, I was going to Woolworths and I walked past Tammy's tie and I think I was like five days deep and I was like, the aroma of Tammy's Thai came past and I started thinking about how good it would be to just go in there and just get some sade skewers, just simple sade skewers. And I started making all these considerations about, all right, God, if I do this, I'll add a day on. I'll do 22 days. If I do that, is that okay? I started thinking about, man, I could, you know, oh. <laughs> I started making all these considerations. And to be honest with you, I just had to really declare... 2 Corinthians 10, 5 over my life, that, I, that, that I've got to capture every thought and make it submit under the mighty hand of Jesus. Our beliefs are a product of how we think. Focus on what, focus what you think and see how God's favor will flow in your life. Right thinking receives God's favor. The second point is this. Right hearing receives God's favor. Right hearing. I love that as we pick it up in John 21, 4 to 6. You know, at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who, was, who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul it in the net because there were so many fish in it. The fish were already in the water. They fished all night. They clearly knew how to fish. What changed? I think what changed was this. What was a distraction to them just became a God assignment to him. I love that how the disciples responded. 
They could have ignored the person on the beach. They didn't actually know who it was. There must have been an inkling. There must have been something that, that, that was in their soul that maybe thought, oh, there's a reason why this person's asked me to do this. And they listened. I love that. That we have the same power that resurrected Jesus living inside of us and that we can listen, we can listen to a voice that can either stir faith or stir fear in us. Church, we need to align our ears with the promises of God. That we need to stop polluting our focus on who or what we're listening to. You know, so often I, I, I'm speaking to people all the time, especially, you know, young adults that, that are sharing aspirations and dreams and sharing opportunities that they've got, only to find that they, they haven't got the confidence to actually step out and do it because they're listening to the wrong voices. They're listening to people that often can bring up the past or bring up the limitations of the future rather than actually standing with them and, and building the God confidence in them and bringing scripture into their situation and declaring his favor over their life. God is calling us to do things, great things, but we lack the confidence to step out because we're listening to the wrong voices. I love that Proverbs 4.23. It says to guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. We need to be more selective about what we're listening to. Now, as a parent, you understand that your kids are selective about you and what you say. That so often I'll be like, you know, only yesterday we'll go into the beach. How good was the weather yesterday, by the way? Perfect. It was like um, spring, had a holiday and came back. So thankful for that. But yesterday I was just packing and I'm telling the girls, all right, we can go to the beach if you clean your rooms. And they were like, yes, we'll do that. But only moments before I was like, hey, go take the trash out. No one listened to me. They're selective of what dad says. And I think sometimes we've got to start being more selective about what we're listening to, that we actually need to be more selective and start to filter the things that we are allowing into our spirit. That if faith is a product of what I hear, then faith comes from hearing, hearing the Word of God. Right hearing comes from submitting what I listen to under the Word of God. It's time that we need to change what we listen to. If it's not true, honourable, right, pure, lovely or worthy of praise, then I don't need to listen to it. We need to remember we already have it in Jesus' name. But we can get so distracted if we're listening to the wrong voices. Right right listening comes. Right listening receives God's favor. The third point is this, is that right speaking receives God's favor. That we need to focus what we say. I love that when Jesus was on the shore and he was with the disciples, you know, I mean, we just seen this miracle again that he'd, he'd shown these disciples many, many years ago, only three years before this time. And he gathered them and he, and he showed them what a real fillet of fish looks like, that it wasn't from Maccas, but it was a bit of bread and just a bit of fish. But he says here, and he pulls Peter aside, and, and I love this because we all know, if you, you've got to go back and you've got to look it up yourself. But you know, originally, you know, I mean, Peter's name was Simon. He changed it to Peter it had, very, it had great significance around it. But he's pulling Peter aside and he says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter here in John 21, 15, 17. And we've read this many, time, but, many times, but I just want to point out something that I think is so, so incredible here. That we know that this is Simon Peter who had left Jesus at the cross. He denied him three times. You know, we know that Peter was a hothead. Swore all the time, did things that he wasn't proud of. Um, sh- very, very, very short fuse. But in Jesus' moment of need, he, he left him. He, he'd actually abandoned him. It says here in John 21, 15 and 17, it says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Simon um, Peter replied. You know I love you. 
and then feed my lambs. Jesus told him, Simon, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. And then take care of my sheep. Jesus said a third time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I think when, when, whenever there's something mentioned several times in the Bible over and over again, I think we've got to listen and you've got to lean in. But I love that not only was Jesus reinstating Peter here, but he was speaking life over him, that he was declaring the favor of God over his life. You know, you could be looking at a real situation, but coming to a false conclusion. Peter, because he denied Jesus, abandoned him at the most humiliating moment that, that he thought he was finished. But Jesus had a different plan. What we say is a reflection of what we believe. You know, we can't undermine the promises of God by what we're saying, by what we're speaking over our life what we could be potentially speaking over someone else's life. We've got to change what we say. That we could be looking at failure right now down the barrel of a gun, thinking, far out, I've just done this, and how could I ever be reinstated? How could I ever be living right again? How can I ever be forgiven? But this is what I know about God, is that when we start to declare God's promises over our lives, yeah, we've lost some years. Yeah, that, that is what I was, but this is who I am now. God works all things out. That no weapon formed against me shall prosper. That every tongue which rises against you in judgment will, shall be condemned. That I'm a child of God. I love that in worship. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Declaring God's favor over our lives. That He calls you righteous while you're struggling with addiction. He calls you forgiven even when you've stuffed up again. He's called you victorious even when you feel like a failure. He's restored you. He's redeemed you. He's called what isn't into existence. You're already blessed and highly favored by God. You can't do any more or less than to, just to position our thoughts, that what we're saying and what we believe, that we are allowed to, that we create a funnel for His favor in our lives. So what does this mean? That anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone. A new life has begun. I love that, that when we start to think about these words and we start to declare His favor over our lives, that's when we position ourselves for His favor. That not only are we trying to chase it, but we've already got it. That we can't do any more than just to say yes and amen. I know that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us when we feel so alone. So if we're going to walk in the promises and the favor of God, we need to keep our focus on right thinking, on right hearing, and right speaking. The good news. This is the good news. Because of Jesus, we already have it. We just need to remember it. We just need to remember it, that we already have it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We get so distracted. We can find ourselves so off course thinking about things that we shouldn't be thinking about. We find ourselves aligning ourselves with voices that we shouldn't align ourselves with. And every time we go to step out in that dream or that opportunity, we find ourselves hesitating because we're in a crisis of confidence because we've chosen to put our confidence in things that God never asked us to put them in, but rather we, uh, we're supposed to be putting them in Him. That often we can be thinking about things and a product of our thoughts can be what we believe. And instead of speaking life into a situation, we're just condemning ourselves, saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not ready. How can I go for that promotion when, when I'm not, when I've done all this? Or there's so many other people that are more qualified. But no, you're qualified. You're blessed and highly favoured. That is what God thinks about you. We've got to get right thinking, right hearing, 
and right speaking in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Cool. With every head bowed and eyes closed, I just want to pray for two, two people, two types of people today. You know, as I've been speaking this, you know, I mean, something's clicked. Something's actually turned on for you. You're going far out. I've been working so hard for the favor of God, I didn't realize I already had it. That you may be thinking of yourself, well, I, I've been, I'm here today and I keep turning up to church and I keep singing the songs and I say amen when they say amen. And, but you're not really living for Jesus. You're existing, but you're not living for Jesus. You're not living in the favour of God. And so I just want to invite you right now into a prayer where you may be feeling abandoned or lost or, or struggling in this season because you've just gotten distracted. The second group of people I want to pray for is that I've been talking about Jesus. Jesus who came and died for you, set you free. Calls you son, calls you daughter. And you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, and you've never accepted Jesus into your life. I want to encourage you. It will be the greatest decision that you'll ever make. Not only because He's already set you free. Not only because He has a better plan for you. But He also has an eternal purpose for you. Heaven and hell is real. And at the end of this life, we're going to be going to one or the other. And I want, to, I want to say a prayer with you so that I know that you can be a part of that purpose and that eternal plan that God has for your life. You know, this prayer, it's, it's one that I'm going to give you the words to say and you just need to repeat them after me and everybody in this room is going to be saying this prayer with you. But I want to invite you that if you don't know Jesus yet, then please, when I count to three, put up your hand and say this prayer with me. If you have felt yourself distracted, yeah, you're doing the motions, yeah, you're, you're turning up and you're doing all the right things, you're ticking the boxes, but, but you're, that you're still so far away from Jesus. You once had a relationship with Him, but now you're just living for yourself. That's like being out all night and you're fishing and fishing and fishing and you catch nothing. Jesus is calling you home. He's saying, son, come home. He's saying, daughter, come home. I love you. You're forgiven. You're set free. I've got a better plan. And so if you're a part of that, I'm going to count to three to just give you time to get ready. But when I say three, please put up your hand. Repeat these words after me. And we'll go from there. In Jesus' name. One, two, three. If you want to be included in that prayer, please put up your hand in this place right now. Online. They're about to put a button there that you can click on. Fantastic. Great. Well, let's say these words after me. Dear God, come on, let's say it together. Dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, who died for me. And so today, I ask that you become the Lord and Savior of my life. That you would forgive me of all my sins. Help me to do everything you've called me to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give God a mighty hand of praise. Let's thank Him in advance for those people that said yes.